have to take from the mountains of West Virginia. about the unknown, the unexplainable. Do you find yourself intrigued by the mysterious and paranormal side of our world? Join us on an adventure into the world of inexplicable discoveries and investigations that may someday give us a final answer as to what may be behind the veil of reality. Then it's time to turn your pods up because we're live to tape from the mountains of West Virginia. It's time once again for Let's find out with co-host Diego. The universe is waiting for you. <laughs> Live to tape from the mountains of West Virginia. It's another episode of Let's Find Out with co-host Diego. Thank you for taking this journey with me on this episode of Let's Find Out. We're going to venture our way down the rabbit hole. Our guest has been an empath his whole life. His journey down the rabbit hole began at the age of 17 when he had a chance meeting and friendship with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. With over 30 years of experience in paranormal research, investigations, and demonology, he's one of the top professionals in this field. We're going to dive into all this plus more. Please welcome a great friend, supporter of the show, and fellow historically haunted booking family member, Thomas Patrick Gormley. Thomas, my friend, welcome to Let's Find Out. This is actually our first time, other than texting back and forth on Facebook, we've had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Uh, I love your stuff. I love your history. I love thank you. You know, what you do and all. And I'm just so glad you have me on and we could talk about weird stuff and going down the rabbit hole and uh, just anything in the paranormal and anything that we could talk about is going to be a good time. Yeah. And, you know, I've been following you for, for, for a short time because I've, I've been with Adam um, maybe for about three or four months. And then um, I started looking at his client list. And then, of course, I go down my own rabbit hole and see what he's, what everybody's <laughs> all about. And I'm like, well, this cat, you know, he's really on top of his game. And when you agreed to come on the show, man, I was ecstatic. So thank you for coming on. I know, you have a very busy schedule and we talked about this during the introduction of the show your whole life you've you've been an empath and it's one of those things that i know when you started early in life as i did you don't really put the clues together and find out what exactly is going on uh, at what age did you realize that you had this gift and what it was exactly it's just your when you have this ability your, your whole life, you don't know why you feel the way you do. Um, I could walk into a room and just oh, feel anger or sadness or things like that. I, I didn't know. I thought, geez, something's wrong with me or, or something like that. And uh, I think it was the chance meeting that I had with um, at 17. Uh, I had some friends who were just like messing around. It was coming up on Halloween. I said, hey, let's go see these guys talk about their spooky stuff. So I went to uh, a college in uh, New Britain, Connecticut called Central Connecticut, and we saw a speech there. And it was given by Ed and Lorraine Warren, which a lot of people, your listeners probably know who they are. And as I'm watching it and all that, you know, it was great. And then afterwards, they let you do a meet and greet. And it was so weird because you're back there and there's, you know, 50, 60 people back there waiting to meet Ed and Lorraine Warren. And Lorraine just like, it was almost like the parting of the seas, like it was almost biblical. And she just came right up to me and says, you've been having problems that you want answered. It's almost like she picked up on it. I don't know if she recognized me while I was in the audience and just wanted to, you know, come and let me know afterwards. And then just after talking for a while, 
you know, I started going uh, over to the house. Uh, I never really did a full out investigation with them, uh, but we were friendly and, uh, you know, time passed quickly because 17, you know, a couple of years later, I was off to college and I really lost track of them. But it was usually on Halloween, I would go to the house and they would do some uh, really cool uh, show the really good footage of, of what they found over the years. And I got to know a lot about what they did and how they did it. And Lorraine helping me learn about my abilities to come, you know, to terms with them and get them more under control and understand them and be able to use them for better. And as, you know, time went on, you know, I got better and better at it and understood it more and wanted to be able to help other people. And it's crazy is I've been doing it for over 30 years, but I think I really dove in really heavily uh, after my mom died in, in 2012. I think I needed more answers for myself. And in the same time, I wanted to answer for other people because I was in mourning and I, I felt I always want to help people. And I felt with other people mourning the way I was, I wanted to be able to share that with them and be able to maybe help them heal uh, with, you know, their questions about what possibly might happen to us after we pass or go beyond the veil if people are still there or or anything like that now during your time when you visited their home and you don't have to describe how their home looked like or exactly what <laughs> it is um they showed you a lot of things so they probably showed you um clips or audios of some of their cases what stands out the most out of the things that you saw there that they showed you I, th I think a lot of it is, you know, everybody knows about the museum and all that, you know, a, a attached to the side of the house and all that. There, there's, you know, the the lore of what people talk about, the gazebo in the back that's been made famous in some of the movies and all that. Uh, but I, I think really when you sit there with them, um, I think it's more them than the house, um, just who they were. Um, Ed was no nonsense. L Lorraine was just stately, you know, she was just such a, you know, like everybody's grandmother. And I, I, they were just so engaging. And I, I think the, some of the stuff they showed just how serious, you know, things could get if you let certain types of trauma get out of control, uh, certain darkness and jumping into things that you don't understand and what could happen. And when you see that, um, you jump back for a little bit and it's like, well, what would I do if that happened to me? And it's more of a lesson, um, you know, and a lot of us, there's so many people that are offspring of the war and especially here in Connecticut, um, they've learned a lot and we've continued that legacy on. Uh, it's weird. It's almost like football. You know, you have this great coach like Bill Belichick and then all his offspring, they all become coaches and all that. I, I just think Ed and Lorraine are almost that same thing. There's a lot of offspring of them. Um, you know, we've just taken what they have done over the years and we've continued that legacy uh, just to educate people in the same thing they always wanted to do. Don't play with things you don't understand. And, and that's kind of what we continue to do. You know, and I'm 100% on board with that because we'll get into here in a minute. A lot of the things that um are played on social media, especially a lot of these newer paranormal investigating teams when they're messing with things that maybe they shouldn't be messing with. Um, so, but before we get into that, let's go back to the empath part of this. What are some of the common misconception of what an empath is? Because we all know that sometimes. Hollywood and certain people to kind of stretch the truth a little bit and kind of, I think it muddy the waters. And I think it, it takes away from the credibility of the people who are actually empaths or even or psychics or anything like that. So in your opinion, what are some of those common misconceptions? I think a lot of it ha has an empath. Uh, I'm not a medium. A, a medium is somebody that, you know, could speak to the dead. Um, I'm not really psychic. I, I don't have that prediction thing. Some of the some of those things do come in and out. But as an empath, I I feel energies of people's feelings and all that. It's almost like I tune in. And I think as an empath, I 
a lot of people that are empaths have been through a lot of trauma in life. So they have that extra spidey sense behind them and uh, they, they pick up on those things. And uh, I, I think that's what it is. And, but occasionally being open to that and you go into what I call like a more of a relaxation, I do open myself up to other things that are beyond empath. But I think everybody has psychic abilities. We're all born with it. Uh, we lose it over time. Um, a person I worked with, uh, she's a psycho. She was a psychotherapist. And uh, the thing is, is when, as a psychic, when you tune in, you go into what's called theta. Uh, that's how most people, you know, tune in. That's you. What? That's the time when your brain is about to fall asleep, or you're about to wake up. And that's when you're really in tune and, and psychics and, and mediums are able to get to that stage uh, like pretty quickly. And uh, sometimes I find myself as an empath in that stage and sometimes I'll see things. I've, I've seen spirits sitting in my couch watching a show and just kind of relaxing about to fall asleep and I'll just see something walk through my door and all that. It's open. But being an empath, being able to feel the energies, it's almost like I tell people you're like, you're like a candle in the darkness and, and things are like attracted to that light and they want to talk to you and all that. Unfortunately, I can't really talk to them without maybe some equipment, <laughs> but I do feel their energy. I do feel them around me. I've had family members come to me. Um, I think one of the other gifts that I have is I'm able to pick up on sense knowing that somebody's there. Uh, I know in my father's parents my grandparents are around i could smell their house i know they're around like my grandmother used to smoke my other grandmother used to smoke cigarettes and before she'd come back in the house she would have a little mint like i have that cigarette mint smell so i know she's around you know our loved ones never leave us love never dies and they're always around us even our ancestors and all that they're there to guide us and uh i, I firmly believe that I know my mom's still around, my dad's still around, still trying to get me to go in the right direction. <laughs> I know, you know, being here, I don't always go in the right direction. I don't make the best decisions, but, you know, you always got to keep that openness to it. And I've told people before, um, I'm not a firm believer in coincidence. I think anytime a, what we perceive as a coincidence happening, uh, I think that's our loved ones, our ancestors, our spirit guides, putting us back on the right path. And it's a lesson that we need to hear and listen to. So it's definitely one of those things. It's almost like they're trying to teach you from their past experiences and what to look out mm -hmm. for, you know, during the course of your life. Correct. Exactly. So you, you need to, you need to be open. Um, yeah. A lot of people say go at your gut sometimes and all that, but it's a little of all that, you know, we have to be open and pay attention to what's going on around us. There's a lesson of everything. So, you know, when my mom died, I knew she was around. Her favorite thing was butterflies. And it was in November and I pulled into where I was working and there was a monarch butterfly flew in on my front of my car. There's no reason for a monarch butterfly to be around in November. It's too darn cold. So, you know, me thinking, well, that's not a coincidence. There's a message there. And at the time I was going through a lot uh, at that moment in that November, I think there was a lot of changes going on. And I think she was letting me know there was changes going around and that she was there to support me. So that's what I picked up on and it was very helpful. So knowing that family never leaves you and all that, you should never feel alone. Um, they're there for you. Just be open to it. That's the beautiful thing that you said. Going back to something you said earlier, and forgive me if you if you answered this question. When you're talking about we're all born with certain abilities, and over time we we lose this ability, is it something that's done because of choice, or is there something in the um, religious upbringing, or some people have that natural skepticism of what it could be? Yeah. Well, you're exactly right. When we're born, young kids, you know, they have their imaginary friends and all that. They're very open to it. Uh, young children, like I was talking about, the theta wave, um, from when you're born up almost the age of, I think it's seven scientifically, we stay in theta wave 
so we're more open to what's going on around us. Um, you know, that's why they have their imaginary friends. They see relatives or anything like that. Most people that have had their first experience are in that time frame. Uh, but when you start hitting the age of seven, that's when critical thinking starts kicking in. Um, I have a psychology background, so the, the, the critical thinking starts kicking in. That's where you start understanding more that your parents like, yeah, that isn't real. And then you're like, well, maybe it isn't real. And then you shut that muscle down. So it's almost like playing golf. If you don't play golf every day, you're never going to be good at it. You know, you just can't pick it up and think that you're going to be Tiger Woods. So it, it, it's a muscle that it, it becomes dormant. It's always there. Uh, it could be reawakened, but again, it's like anything else. Some people are very good at it. Some people are okay at it. It's just with anything, you know, I, I hate to keep talking about sports, but I think that's a lot of our connection, but you know, there's some really great football players and there's some football players that play to college, some play a pro, some play only up to high school, but they're still good football players and all that. So we, we learn at different stages. It's never gone it's a matter of practice and being open and, and learning and reading and going to other people that are very good at it to have them help you if that's the direction that you want to go. Yeah. And interesting going directions because you're one of the few people that I know currently there I would consider on the subject of demonology, you've been into that well, for many decades now. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So I have some knowledge in, in this field. Now, for those listeners that don't know much about my history, and I really don't talk about it so much, weird it is, yeah, I'm a Protestant and I have a show like the way that I do with my roots being in a Pentecostal church. And those who have witnessed or ever been into Pentecostal church, things can get a little bit crazy, but they have a healthy respect for, for things that are out of the ordinary and spiritual because they, you learn a lot about demon, demonology, demons and evil. Um, you have a healthy respect for, for that in a weird way. Here's why I'm going into this right now. And I think you know where I'm going with this, where you have a lot of young bucks out there during their investigations there. Um, they might be trying to conjure up things they may not be able to handle if it does happen. Some of them are just doing, using the word demons just to get, you know, a lot of views and downloads or whatever kind of nonsense they're doing. But you know, and I know, especially with our background, this is not something you really want to mess with if you're not fully prepared and you don't understand what you're getting yourself into. Um, demons are a much more serious thing and they can be very dangerous. Um, what's been your experience in the field of demonology, especially during your investigations? Have you ever really encountered one of these things? I never really encountered anything that evil. There's the perception of it. Um, you know, I've done a lot of cases where it presents as that, um, where I'll have a case where a, a young boy was getting scratched in poltergeist activity and the first thing you're going to think of is like what you're talking about these kids on these shows the first thing they're going to do is say oh my god it's a demon really that case it wasn't uh if you do your due diligence and all that it's very rare that you know less than one percent maybe it, that's why they make movies about it that it's going to be an actual demon but the possibility is there if you dare it too much. Uh, but with this case, you know, the boy was getting scratched. It was more of a spirit reaching out. Um, he knew the boy had psychic abilities, which he didn't know. Again, the beacon of light. And with that, um, we figured out that the spirit was sorry for the way he was in life. Uh, he was a World War II vet. Uh, became an alcoholic because he didn't get over the PTSD because nobody had the the ability at the time to psych you know psychiatrically treat the guy at the time. Nobody was going to reach out. Type of guys like that, tough guys like that. You know they're great, but they don't get that help. And then you become an alcoholic because you're counteracting what you saw and how to get over it. And he was sorry for the way he was in life. And we were able to help you know the spirit out with with that by uh, 
um, helping them overcome that. And, uh, you know, that that's the misconception sometimes that something's demonic or it really isn't. But I'm going to tell you my viewpoint over all these years. Anytime something dark happens, I think it's us personally. Um, we conjure that type of thing, um, almost like we do our own self aggregor and aggregor is something if you give it enough thought, you could bring it to an existence. Um, I, I think most the times if you look at any time an exorcism happens or anything like that, even that movie recently, the Pope's exorcist, uh, if you watch that movie, if you really listen to what the people are talking about, you figure out why uh, this is happening. It's trauma. It's untreated trauma. Um, I've gone into a lot of cases where dark things are going on. Um, it's somebody overcoming a drug addiction. Um, it's unhealthy um, mourning from somebody that passed away. Uh, you know, even to the point where people are just negative things happening in their life. And sometimes it's deep down. They don't even know what's going on. And those things when you bring them about and they take control of you your mind your thoughts and all that and um, that's where a lot of this darkness happens and i think you know when we do things like an exorcism and all that i think it's more of we need to take care of the trauma to get rid of the evil and the darkness and all that and that's kind of where it, it, it goes. Um, I know a lot of people, the different religious beliefs and all that, you know, I, I've dealt with every esoteric thing you could think of, every different religion. I, I've gone into houses where some people don't consider it a demon, they consider it a jinn or anything like that. You know, you have to deal with everybody's different viewpoint. But really, after all these years and studying and reading and all that, I really think it comes down to your traumas, uh, your negative thoughts and all that, and playing with things you don't understand is probably the biggest thing. You're inviting things in. It's almost like the old the old saying, you know, if you ever see the old vampire movies, it's like, don't invite the vampire in because once he is invited in, you're all done. It's the same thing, you know. It, it's off that context. It's biblical and all that. It's off that context. Once you invite something negative in, you're all done. It, it, it's like life, you know, positive and negative. If you let, you know, your energy vampires, which I call them, these people that you meet that just suck the energy out of you, if you let them do it, they're going to do it. So it, it, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, us talking right now or just the spirit world or beyond the realm. They're waiting. They're waiting for you to be negative, to, to, to take control of that trauma that you're having. And you invited them in to control your trauma where you should have controlled it beforehand. That's very interesting. So in a sense with these energy vampires, let's say they I mean, they find a mark or a victim sort of sort to use a. I would like to use a better word, but I'm going to use that word victim. The negative energy that they've um, conjured up and is now has his own. Um, I'm going to say consciousness or energy. That energy is going to want to feed more to be stronger. So, of course, it's going to task that person to attach itself to somebody else so it grows even stronger, too. Is mm -hmm. that what it feeds off of somebody else's energy and just keeps getting stronger and stronger? Oh, yeah, exactly. An energy vampire just wants to, to break you down. Uh, it, it's funny. Those are the people that you meet sometimes. There's people I just like, I've run into a few of them. I've actually. Uh, it's funny, I had a, a manager that I worked with recently, and then I used to call him an energy vampire. It's just, you just don't, why is this guy thinking this way? And it just, I let him suck the energy out of me, and I should know better. Uh, but, you know, it's tough when you work with somebody on a regular basis. It's hard to protect yourself for a long period of time because, you know, my normal job, I'm working, you know, almost 12 hours a day. You know, you know, it, it, it's rough. And, uh, you know, I work in my normal jobs in sales and, you know, that's that's rough, too, because you're dealing with all those different energies and all that and trying to protect myself on a daily basis. But, uh, yeah, that's what you run into. Um, they're all over the place. You know, uh, 
you talk to somebody and you just feel drained. Um, they, they love it. And they don't even know they love it sometimes. They don't even know they might have something attached to them. They don't even realize it. And so in your opinion for, and sometimes we can't control what happens around us. We can only control how we react to it. So Mm -hmm. how does one, in your opinion, be able to defend themselves against a negative force like that or an energy vampire to where it'll lose interest in you and go somewhere else? It it's recognizing it, um, and it's it's really hard to pinpoint because everything's different. Uh, everybody's personality is different, and all that. And then how you approach those things, because a lot of times some of these en- energy vampires they have their traumas and all that. So, and uh, I'm a firm believer, you know, what I used to do for a living um, that I left when I was in the state of Florida, I was crisis manager for prison system and all that so and i think it's very helpful and also keeping energies at bay um when in a crisis situation if you know somebody's name you have control over them it's the same thing with these energy vampires and all that yeah you may know their name but if you could call out their trauma then you might have control over the situation so it's just like an exorcism, you know, they always want to know the name of the demon. And I'll tell you this, once you know the name of the demon and all that, you have control over it. It goes back to your traumas. Like I said, an alcoholic, they call out the name of it. They say in their step program, I'm an alcoholic. They put a name on it. They put a name on their trauma. Once you put a name on something and all that, you have control over it. And that's the whole thing. When you're engaged with an energy vampire, once you have a name and why they're an energy vampire and all that, it's tough to read sometimes. But if you're open and you can hear why they're that way and you put a name on it, then you might you'll probably have control over it and be able to take care of the situation and move from it. Right, because it's one of those things you can identify the problem and now you have something to go with and you can work on that part. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's very interesting because back in my churches, I used to do something like that too. It's called that's the demon of you know, that's the demon of nicotine, the demon of alcoholism, the demon of drug mm-hmm. use. So they call out the bad behavior in order to deal with that behavior uh, in their own way, of course. Everybody does it a little bit different. So, um, what got you interested in that whole field of demonology to begin with? I, I think it's you know being with Ed and Lorraine and that influence and all that, but just over the years and learning that, just like we talked about, so many people have traumas and all that, so many people have negatives and carrying on the tradition of the Warrens and people messing with things they don't understand. But I think it's more for me is helping people understand what it might be. And again, putting the name on it and having control over it and being able to help people move on from the negative that's that's bringing them down. So, so in a sense, did you get a, like a little informal, formal training from them in order to, um, I guess, better understand what's going on, correct? Yeah, you, you know, being being around them for the, the little time that I was and all that, you, you do have that influence. But I think a lot of it, I think it's a calling sometimes. You have to be very introspective for yourself and um, look at yourself in the mirror and what you get from it again it's it's also naming it for yourself why am i doing this what what is the purpose and really doing the paranormal being able to help people is my purpose and uh, i need to be very versed in all aspects of it i know some people have their little niches and i've talked about this before the paranormal is almost like music some people like country some people like rock and roll some people like jazz and all that they're all different types of music, but again, it's all music. The same thing in paranormal. Everybody has their niche and all that. But for me, I've been at it for a long time. I, I feel like I don't fit in a genre. I think I'm well-versed on I'm trying to be well-versed on every aspect and uh, take a you know very professional approach to look at everything. And I really appreciate 
everybody that tries to bring the paranormal forward. Uh, but again, uh, I don't like the fake stuff that, that gets put out there. I don't like the challenge of demons and all that because I know what could happen. Uh, I've seen it, um, you know, but I'm not going to tell people not to do what they love to do. But I'm there to help support and educate. If you want to learn, great. If you don't, then the consequences could be very bad. Uh, very true. And I know uh, sometimes I come down hard, especially on the um, the young cats out there, only because it's a trial and error kind of thing. So things that you think are going to work, maybe to your own immaturity down the road can either hurt you or you'll learn from it. I think that's great to have folks as yourself that would be willing to um, show people, you know, what you can and can't do or shouldn't do because things go south pretty quick. Now, moving on to something a little bit different because – I sent you some pictures not long ago. Okay, we're, we're going to maneuver through the rabbit hole a little bit. Oh, yeah. Um, because there is a popular belief, in, in, especially in, in some of the church circles, where so we're going to transition from demons to aliens because there are those that believe that perhaps aliens are just actually demons that are masquerading as, as aliens in order to fool the world of some sorts. But that's a whole different thing. So mm -hmm. and I don't think we have three hours to discuss this because I could do <laughs> um, so I could too. <laughs> you know, oh, good. Maybe we make like a five-part episode. Yeah. Um, not long ago. I think this was just last week. And it made the mainstream news. So, of course, with a grain of salt, sometimes what they report. We're talking about Miami. And I'm going to pull up. Nobody can see the pictures you won't see. But I got them right. I pulled up these pictures that I – um borrowed from somewhere <laughs> and um a little background to this story to where there was some sort of potential riot or disturbance going down and out in miami florida now miami does have a it's a history of ufo sightings i know it in the gulf breeze area was a big thing for a while i think it was in the 90s early 2000s might have been in the 80s my mind's a little bit foggy right now so to present date for last week where these youths, I think it might have been dozens or 50 or something like that, were out there with sticks, shooting fireworks in the public, causing a public disturbance. There was a huge law enforcement presence that was filmed during this event, rightly so, because if there's a potential riot and there's People out there that are going to be hitting people with sticks and throwing fireworks. Who knows? It could be arsony down the road. I understand the reaction, but here's the thing, my friend. I'm going to bring up this picture to where I'm not sure which which um, order I sent them to you. So I'm bringing up the pictures right now where it has the, the police officers, three cruisers in this picture. There's a police officer on their lower left, and there's a humanoid-looking creature on the top right. Mm -hmm. Um from the videos that I saw, and I'm looking at the picture, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna scroll to the next picture to where, and I'll put this on the YouTube version for the for the listeners to look at. It seems that this, I'm gonna say this um, unknown thing is just walking by the whole action, but nobody's paying attention to it. I don't know why that is. Um, and for the millions of dollars have been spent on new cameras, whether it's a big for an alien, you can damn well get a clear picture of anything um but i did see the video and it did look like it potential i say potential but my question is this let me ask you this i'm so long-winded if this were an actual extraterrestrial or alien walking down the sidewalk in the middle of a potential riot nobody pays attention to it that's a little fishy to me i don't understand that part i for me looking at it and all that it could go either way um, again, I, I'm, I get people that send me stuff all the time, unless I was there and be able to see what's going on. I can't really say a hundred percent, but being a background in law enforcement in looking at that, as I kind of zoomed in, it almost looked like three like heads in a tactical stack. But the thing that got me is when you're in a tactical stack like that, that usually means you're in close quarters combat. You're about to enter a room and you're in a jagged stack. And as you enter the room, you know, you, you have the left to right and all that to clear the room. But it's in such an open area 
where those stairs were is like, why would they be in a tactical stack in an open area like that? That's why nobody was, you know, like they were searching. Um, you know, it, it didn't make sense to me. And that's why I try and look at things, you know, with police, um, you know, because they're so surrounded the area and letting things move through. I'm thinking, well, it's got to be other police officers and all that. But why would you be in a tactical stack? It makes no sense to be in that area as they're searching. Um, you know, if it was something not of this world and all that, it's just like anything else. Um, sometimes, you know, I've seen video of you see a guy talking on a video camera and nobody sees who he's talking to, but yet he saw a person, but it doesn't pick up on the camera. Sometimes vice versa, where we'll see something on a camera that the camera picks up that the people there don't see. Um, you know, who's to say aliens aren't able to create that invisibility to the people that are there as they move through as some people consider aliens to be interdimensional sometimes where they can move in and out and we don't know that they're there sometimes and uh that that's what creates the doubt um and you know the whole situation is just crazy because they said a riot was like breaking out and i look at it right yeah you look at it this way um Two different things could be happening to break a riot out and all that. You know, we think of terrorism and all that, where you're going to attack as a terrorist, uh, you know, the place with a lot of people to create chaos. Um, you know, but I look at it this way, alien wise, how do we perceive aliens? Are they there to create chaos to put us against each other or are they there to intervene? Um, you know, I'm thinking in this situation, that being interdimensional, because they've been described as 10 foot tall shadow aliens. And that's the thing that got me is because there is the talk of shadow people being interdimensional and being able to move in and out without us really knowing, especially when they're the dark of the dark. And that's what people see. But are they just watching? Did they, you know, some people think aliens could, you know, mess with our minds and make us do things that we don't want to do and did they make these kids start this riot and then watch the chaos and then when the chaos happened it created a problem with that interdimensional exposing the alien uh, for people to see uh, or were the aliens there to intervene so it didn't become something worse are they on a different timeline than us where they were able to intervene where the situation didn't get worse. So that, that's the things that I think about. I don't know how other people think, but, but I think, you know, if they expose themselves, whether there's something there or not there, we won't know because we weren't there. Uh, we could speculate all we want, but anything could happen. I, you know, we're, we're in a universe of billions of galaxies. Are we alone? There's no way we would be stupid to think we were alone. But then again, I'm thinking about how we are and what I watch on social media and all that. Why would these guys want to come visit us anyway? <laughs> yeah. you know, I think it's either, well, my opinion is they're already here mm -hmm. because they came from here. I don't think they, maybe they didn't come from a outer space, but if they're traveling in our solar system, yeah. But I think they're from here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it could be a, the whole thing with, of course, interdimensional. It could be inner Earth. It could be some sort of Stargate system or cave system they travel through. I mean, they have thousands of years ahead of us. They could do what they want in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to go back to the picture. And I'm thinking this. There's two things. Because the more I scrutinize the picture, it could be the fact that maybe the says it's some kind of blurry. Because mm -hmm. police strobe lights, they're going to mess up your camera. Exactly. Especially because it's not up close, and you're looking at it from above. I don't know if it came from the helicopter or from a drone. And two, it might just be that nobody there saw this being, but the camera just happened to catch it. Yeah. I don't know. It's. I mean, it, it's pretty interesting footage. And also one of the things is I haven't seen any other angles or camera footage from anywhere other than this one right now. And that's the thing that 
that gets me is everybody has these phones and cameras to be able to videotape stuff, but yet there was a lot of interviews. I saw one interview with one of the gentlemen, and he, he looked like he couldn't wrap his head around what was going on. And you could tell when somebody's just freaked out uh, and when they're not, when they're making something up. He, he seemed generally freaked out. But again, there's the old thing where people see Bigfoot and all that, and they never get video footage of it when they're staring. Uh, there's the old thing where we, we have the infrasound, where it seems like it stuns us and it keeps us from doing what we think we should do. It's almost like a mind control where I think if these aliens expose themselves, they have the ability to keep us from videotaping or anything like that with this infra type of sound or what kind of mind control they might have. Um, and I think that's why we don't get that footage, but we got the footage from the helicopter or the drone, what you talk about, because it's not really part of that area where the aliens cognizant of, or the perceived aliens cognizant of what's going on around it with that police presence that was there. I still can't get over how many police officers were there. That's the thing that gets me is like, why that many for a possible 40, 50 kids? You know, there was enough police officers for each kid there. So. I think so. And I think it might have been just to, plan for in case it got worse um mm -hmm. it might have been multi-jurisdictional response or ask for backup but in my opinion if this were something would have got really out of hand or there was an actual extraterrestrial walking down a sidewalk i would think that perhaps uh they would have sent the national guard or something like that yeah a higher yeah. response yeah there's but there's so many what ifs and uh all that it it's a crazy situation. I think we're never really going to know exactly uh, to wrap our head around it. And I think that's the way it's always going to be. And that seems like the way the history of these types of encounters always becomes. They downplay it. They try and keep us from getting the actual information. And, uh, you know, it's easy. You could post something and all that. But, hey, the government's a lot quicker than we are. They're going to take it down before we could see it. Uh, if it was anything that anybody had. Since it, it actually, from the video that I shot the picture from, it was from a local news down there in Miami. So mm -hmm. stories like that get quickly forgotten in a way. You're going yeah. to memory hole and uh, the whole planetary amnesia hits in and we move on to the next thing. It seems though, in some people's opinion, Maya as well, where there is always a heightened activity especially with extraterrestrials when there's in times of war or when, when there's time when there's a lot of conflict on earth and it seems that these things pop up every once in a while or uh, sometimes i mean especially now the last few years where there's been a lot of soft disclosure from the government and you'll mm -hmm. see the reports in a sense i go back to something that you were saying is maybe are, are they the ones controlling these events happening around the world yeah, you know, that's the thing that gets me is, are they creating these events um, for chaos uh, to see what we're going to do to each other as a challenge or a lesson? Or are they intervening? Um, those are the two different things that I can't wrap my head around. Are, are they here for good or are they just creating these things just to see what we do? And I, I don't know, it's almost like like they're controlling us like a video game or something, or they're just intervening to keep us from killing each other, <laughs> you know, so I, to keep it from getting out of hand. So it's, yeah, it's crazy. If they've been around for that, that long time, they want to keep things going in the right direction. Sometimes they have to might intervene or, or uh, do things to move things in a different direction. So they already probably know. They probably don't have a timeline. They probably already know what's going to happen, and they're just moving it that direction. Yeah, and um, depending on what belief system you have, it's sometimes they have to start over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, whether it's a comet, a flood, or whatever, an earthquake, everybody gets swallowed away. Sometimes these type of things, civilizations have to start all over again if they don't get it right. Yeah. Well, sometimes uh, things – Lately, what I've perceived was sometimes things start over and we don't even know they start over. We go to sleep at night, we wake up, things start over again. 
a lot of people talk about the Mandela effect where they remember something a certain way and now it's not the same anymore. So who's to say that our mind frame didn't change overnight as we go to sleep and these aliens didn't change our world to either help us or put us in a different direction. I, we don't know. It's just a crazy world. Uh, anything's possible. Uh, I always say this. One of my biggest quotes is just paranormal aliens, anything cryptid, anything you could think of that doesn't make sense. You're never 100% right and you're never 100% wrong. It's impossible to prove. That's why we do this. We Nobody's an expert. Uh, we get experience. Um, we try and push things in the right direction. We have theories and all that. We get better and better at them. But we'll never really, I don't think we'll never really know. I think the chase of it is what makes it so exciting. Absolutely truth, because we're in search of knowledge. We're in search of answers. And sometimes we think we're there, and then we open something new, and boom. Another rabbit hole, right, my brother? Yeah. <laughs> so the rabbit hole is vast, and uh, there's no bottom to it. Um I think once we find the bottom, uh, that's that's when we become part of the rabbit hole. You know, and it's a great journey, too. And for the listeners of the show, talking about journeys, where can they follow you at and to actually keep up what it is that you're doing? And how can they reach out to you if they have any questions about things happening in their life or if they have questions about demonology, paranormal or even extraterrestrials? So I, I do a lot of stuff on uh, social media and I do little snippets on uh, TikTok, um, a lot of historical stuff. Um, you know, I'm on Instagram as the Archangel of the Paranormal. I'm on Facebook as Thomas Patrick Gormley, as I see. And, um, you know, I'm always trying to give tidbits out there. I'm always trying to help people. You can instant message me. I'm more than happy to console people to uh, collaborate with people just to help them with my experience. Uh, but I love collaborating with people because I don't know everything. Nobody knows everything. I think I learn. I could learn something from somebody that's been in the paranormal for a day or somebody that's been in the paranormal for 50 years. I'm Like I said, I'm an open-minded skeptic. I'm open to anybody's opinion. I don't tell anybody they're wrong <laughs> because I don't even know if I'm right. So, But that's the battle. And we, we could throw those ideas off each other our weird experiences, our ideas and all that. And hey, we come to a conclusion that we could agree with and have that camaraderie and all that. Uh, that's what's great about the paranormal. Um, I think especially what we do, we need to have that camaraderie. Uh, we need to know that it's not a competition. It's about doing our due diligence, doing our study, doing our reading, trying our experiments, trying to figure out what the answers are because that's what people want uh, people want to be able to sleep at night when they're having issues and that's one of my biggest things if i could figure out the issue and all that help them with their trauma help them be able to sleep at night and take away the darkness that that's that's it right there that, that's what it's all about you got that right you, nothing can be said better than that my brother thank you again for coming on the show and I know we're early in 2024. Mm -hmm. If you're open to it, because I know there's going to be a lot of events happening from here on till later in this year. Let's pick a few of these things and pick them apart, and then we'll discuss them on the show later this year. If you're open to it, yeah. I'd love to have you back. I oh, learned yeah. so much from you tonight. Yeah, I, I mean, I got a lot of stuff coming up because I do uh, work with uh, another gentleman, uh, Charles Rosenay, and we produce and put on a lot of uh, Paracons. Uh, we do the Connecticut Paracon, the first Connecticut Paracon. We do the Salem Paracon. Uh, we do a lot of psychic fests. And then we do a lot of uh, investigations at historic places and all that. So we have a lot of that coming up. I'm always busy with that. Um, I love doing that. Has the uh, I help him as the shaman and the showman. He has me as the shaman. <laughs> and he's the showman and all that. But it it's fun. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm open to helping a lot of uh, people out. I'll be doing a lot of things with our, our mutual friend, Nate. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, up at Wilson Castle. Uh, we'll be doing the USS Salem in September. Um, and that's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm always there to educate uh, 
people with my experience, again, nobody's an expert, but if I could give my experience, help somebody out, have a different perspective on the paranormal, that's what it's all about. So and it's going to be a fun 2024, and I'm glad you're with me along the ride there. Awesome, man. I'm kind of jealous. I need to make my way up to the Connecticut area. Now, oh, yeah. before I go, I will say this. I have a friend that uh, cryptozoology told me that there is this certain truck stop in Connecticut that's very well known for having issues with rakes. Hmm. And um, I'm very interested in that subject. I think something you and I can discuss later in the year because you know more about Connecticut than I do. But apparently there's yeah. this truck stop there where several truckers have been harassed or been under the, uh, I'll say it, under the spell of these rakes and some sort yeah. of psychic connection or something going on. So we got to talk about that. Once I get more information, I want to get your opinion on that. I'm going to, I'm going to have to look into that. I, I'm feeling that I think I know which truck stop it is too, just because of the area it's in. It, it's an isolated area off the highway. Um, but I'll have to look into it a little bit more. That, that'll be, that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. I love that type of stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect, my brother. We'll have you back later this year. We're going to bring up that topic, and uh, much love to you, my friend. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me, my friend. We will talk very soon. And uh, again, hey, Happy New Year to everybody. And happy New Year to you. This has been another excellent episode of Let's Find Out with co-host Diego. Please check us out on all our social media pages, Spotify, Pandora, and all those awesome platforms, as well on YouTube, and we're also on Rumble. Like, share, subscribe, follow. Thank you for taking this journey with me. Until next time, my friends. Thank you for listening to Let's Find Out with co-host Diego. We're on Spotify, Google Podcasts, TuneIn, Pocket Casts, and on Anchor. For more information about Let's Find Out with co-host Diego, please visit us on facebook.com forward slash co-host Diego, on Twitter at co-host underscore Diego, and on Instagram as co-host Diego. Copyright co-host Diego. All content for Let's Find Out is the property of co-host Diego and is served directly from our servers with no modification, redirects, or rehosting. All celebrity impersonators are paid performers. The impersonated celebrities do not endorse or promote any views or opinions expressed by our guests, co-host Diego, or Let's Find Out. The information shared on Let's Find Out is provided on an as-is basis with no guarantees of completeness, accuracy, usefulness, or timeliness.